what I've just suggested and what I've just described is building a new thing in the world that feels and potentially to your point early on in this conversation, something that feels good things or feels bad things, that feels pains or pleasures. So now we've got a whole serious, you know, uh, set of moral considerations. Following is part four of my conversation with consciousness philosopher, Matt McCormick. In this conversation, Matt takes all the prior conversations, brings them together on a coherent consciousness framework. We use global neuronal workspace theory as the basis of it. But the key part of the discussion is how consciousness gives an evolutionary advantage to organize organisms with finite computational resources. And then we apply that concept to machines as well, that what, for what type of problems, control problems, cybernetic organism problems, uh, consciousness can be helpful in the context of artificial consciousness and artificial consciousness and artificial intelligence to work together in cybernetic organisms that we are working on creating. So Matt uh, takes us through this methodical journey of putting proper definition and framework uh, around that topic. Hope you're going to enjoy it the way we have the prior three episodes and my conversation with uh, Matt will continue. We'll continue to expand in future episodes on other related topics and adjacencies. And now here is my conversation, part four, with none other than Matt McCormick. Our conversations, people have enjoyed them so much. I got so much positive feedback and questions. So uh, you are my friend, uh, making a difference out there to uh, oh, that's great. many people's lives and uh, so what are we going to, uh, Matt, sir, uh, as a continuation of our conversations, what are we going to talk about today? Well, thanks very much. Um, so I, I had gone back and I was watching the podcast that we did and sort of listening more carefully and it gave me a little more pause to be able to focus more closely on what you were saying than what I was saying. And at some point, maybe the second or third one, you had been pressing this point about qualitative states. And we've talked about that a lot and about whether or not machines are gonna have qualitative states and the like. And you were sort of um, pressing around this Chalmers style point, this argument that's on everybody's minds these days that the hard problem can't be solved by physicalism. And you know, I'll, I'll reference everybody to previous discussions in my other videos for you know, background on that. But there's this sort of elephant in the room in the last 20 years for anybody doing philosophy of mind um, of Chalmers's so-called hard problem. And there's a whole industry of people, you know, arguing and publishing papers that say it's not such a hard problem, it's solved and so on and so forth. And I'm one of those people. I don't really, I think it's, um, I think it's a dragon that's been pumped up and it's um, actually a solvable issue. It's not the hard problem everybody thinks it is, but that's a, that's a question that's sort of broken along party lines among philosophers of mind. So if I'm coming along and I want to argue or suggest really speculatively that AI systems might be built that could be conscious, and furthermore, that you know, and I sketch up my plan for that or whatever, I talk about how that might work. The obvious question everybody has is, well, are they going to have, is it is an AI consciousness going to be like ours in that it has qualitative states, internal states where blueberries taste sweet and look blue, and you know stop lines, stop lights look red, and all of that. And that's, you know, I think intuitively for lots of people. And if I can channel, it's been a little while since I watched a video, but if I can channel some of what you were saying earlier, that's like that sticks in everybody's craw. Like that's a weird claim to suggest that a machine could have something like that. And that's one of the most sort of yeah. intuitively outrageous things about what I've been suggesting. So 
I realized that lots of the things I had said um, circled around that point, but I didn't dig in on it enough. And I wanted to elaborate on it enough more because I've got some very, I think I've, much, I've got much clearer ideas about what I want to say about it. And I also realized that we need to talk about global workspace theory in order for me to flesh out the details of my answer to this question. Uh, I'm going to share with you one question from the audience on the earlier episodes. And one, uh, this sort of joke that came up, but not, you know, joke at the expense of charmers. So you were talking about hard problem. So certainly uh, many people who I know uh, that I even worked with from a day-to-day -day basis got to listen to all three episodes. Then they got into your other episodes on your YouTube channel. And so anyways, they got the gist of uh, the hard problem of consciousness. In one of our working sessions, here's an executive. So he says, Chalmers is a marketing genius. Yeah. He came up with the hard problem and everybody's talking about in philosophy for the past 30 years, Yeah, the hard problem. And then he, we were challenged. Can we come up with for our own 2022 goals and initiatives for our software? He was saying, can we compete with charmers? Can you? Can somebody give me the equivalent of hard problem here yeah. in this industry so that the whole universe starts talking about that? Yeah. And of course, you know uh, that is uh, not uh, something easy to do. But I was just. Uh, I did not do anything to initiate it. I, it. I just noticed that, my God, that we are just normal software engineer people and yeah. are developing software uh, and normal software for that matter. Uh, nothing too crazy about it. And we are talking about in our meeting, yeah. charmers and hard problems. That's the joke. The a question that came from the same person. For it's you. absolutely right. I, I and, and I have to say, that it is marketing genius and it works. And the other trick is what you do to insinuate yourself into all of philosophy is you write a short uh, uh, sort of thought experiment paper that has a catchy name or slogan like that, that poses a sort of difficult problem in very vivid terms, like colorblind Mary or the Turing test yeah. or inverted qualia or whatever. And then you get it into the anthologies for introduction to philosophy textbooks or to uh, philosophy of mind textbooks. And then everybody starts talking about it. And as you pointed out, neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, psychologists, computer scientists, everybody talk about it. Partly because it's so, you know, it's so sound biteable. It's just so pithy. Uh, although lots of people talk about it, don't seem, don't really understand what it is. Yeah, yeah, that is also very true. So then the same person asked you, a, gave me a question for you. And the question is, uh, what is the difference between qualia and valence? And then it, this person goes on commenting that is qualia, you know, as you were saying, the redness of red or pain, the, you know, the feeling of the subjective feeling of pain or whatever that is. And is valence then, is it, good for my lively, good for me as a living being or bad for me? And is valence the common language across all many different states of qualia that valence can be good or bad? And, uh, but qualia is that specific qualitative experience. Uh, and is, I think the question is, in your opinion, how do you see qualia versus valence? And is valence this common currency to for these different subjective experiences to maybe at some level uh, communicate with each other. Uh, so over to you, sir. I, I'm not sure if I know that use of the term valence, if I'm understanding this right. I might go look it up after. Uh, the way I will sometimes use the word valence is in the connection with the emotional responses or limbic system responses. So, you know, you see a, 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 a horrific scene of violence on the news and that has an emotional valence for you. So not only are the, the qualitative features of the picture of, you know, 
a murdered body or something, or, you know, the colors, the lines, the surfaces. Um, so that sort of the, take the, the sensory properties of it. But our limbic system produces this uh, sort of a visceral emotional reaction too that kind of drapes over it. And I, I use valence that way. I'm okay. not sure if there's another way it gets used that maybe your questioner is thinking about. So Thank I'm going to talk about qualitative states. Awesome, awesome. And by yeah. that, I mean colors, sounds, um, surfaces, edges, and so forth that um, are that we're in contact with at our sensory periphery and that are produced by you know, our eyeballs, our ears, our fingertips, and our tongues, and so on. Those feels that we get when we encounter objects in the world that way. Yep. I think this person meant from valence that, uh, okay, so certain things taste good, certain things taste not so good, uh, certain colors seem comforting, others not so, some white sounds are pleasant, others right. are not pleasant. And apparently there is something in the uh, neurobiology and homeostasis sort of, you know, uh, uh, literature where things that we become conscious of either are good for us or bad for us. Uh, right. Normal breathing is good. Uh, feeling shortness of breath, bad. So valence apparently is a binary scale of uh, good or bad. Uh, and uh, it looks like that some people talk about projecting these otherwise uh, different states of qualia uh, when you project them on the right. valence plane. So then you can say good or bad. And uh, But anyways, right. I don't know too much about valence either. So, yeah. uh, but that, I think that is kind of the context in which this person uh, brought That's it. super interesting. Um, I tend to think about all of this in term, in, in evolutionary terms. And, you know, I'm, I've been thinking about the evolution of consciousness for a long time, sort of working on a big project here. And it's pretty easy to see that once you get nervous systems online in, you know, I think I've talked about the little hydra, little freshwater organism on a previous talk. Once you get primitive nervous systems online, you know, about 350 million years ago or so, uh, that's pretty easy to see. You can imagine that those nervous systems are then having, what evolution does is it, is it, evolution is, is, is making selections out of the gene pool on the basis of ad adaptive traits. And one of the ways in which evolution, I'm gonna talk about it sort of teleologically, the one of the ways that it discovered how to steer the organism, this great big organism like you and me, is with these aversive feels or you know, appealing feels, things that feel good, things that feel bad, very simple dichotomy here. So it, it, once you get a nervous system in place, you know, by little steps, you can imagine that evolution devised these systems that could then use locomotion to move away from the things that hurt, the, the negative valence uh, sensations and move towards the things that feel good, right? And that's a very simple dichotomy, but then this gets richer and more complex and more diverse over the millennia until it has all of these tiny, very rich, um, complex distinctions and very lots of different contents in a system, you know, like a sensory system like yours or mine, there's all this different content um, that we can only pay attention to a little bit at a time. Okay. So it builds slowly built up from a simple, you know, distinction like that, aversive versus, um, you know, appealing or pleasure pain feels to something more and more rich and, and useful and with finer gradations and scalings to be able to do better world modeling. I mean, ultimately what this is about is, and the way I'd like to portray this is that, well, here, this is actually a good segue. And I think that, um, I, I think it, it'll be long-winded, but I will have an answer or have some more to say about this question um, with what I've said today. So I wanted to make sure I said something really clear and simple about what I'm getting at, um, that I was afraid that might've gotten lost in my you know, digressions in one of the previous conversations. So here's the simple question, simple answer. 
for me, as straight as I can give it. Why would you build a conscious machi machine with conscious with qualitative states? Um, those are already pretty outrageous claims, but my answer is something like this. Evolution uncovered consciousness as we're talking about it and qualitative states, which are the contents of consciousness as vital solutions to some complex world modeling problems in building a reasoning cognitive agent. So consciousness, um, especially a complex one like ours, you build a little world inside, you know, I'm gonna use this inside outside metaphor. It's just a metaphor though. You build a little world inside and I have my thoughts inside and I use that to plan and navigate and explore and theorize about the world outside. And the more information I gather from my explorations of the world, the more, and if I've got the cognitive equipment for it, the better a model I can build of the world that will let me plan, predict, um, avoid, you know, harm, uh, you know, succeed at my goals. Okay, so that's what evolution, that's what consciousness is for in us. Um, so then what about machines? Well, I think the simple answer is we might well want to mimic some of those structures in AI systems um, if we want them to succeed at certain kinds of problems. Uh, you know, you've, you've got a rational agent that evolution built that you set them loose in the world. Imagine a, you know, a toddler on a desert island and they go out and explore and they touch and feel and investigate things and build up a model about what's gonna hurt me, what's gonna feed me, what's gonna clothe, what's gonna keep, make me feel good, what's gonna make me feel bad. And the, the more robust and more complex and more detailed that model in the head of the world that they're at inhabit is, the more successful they'll be at their, you know, the projects, their goals, what they're after. So we may well wanna be a build uh, I mean, we're free not to, but we may want to build AI systems, you know, like you're working on supply chain logistics at Algo. And I can imagine that there's, you know, there's this vast sensory data array that yeah. an AI system could, could have access to. And then we might well want to build an AI system that devises novel solutions to how to manage, you know, supply chain logistics. Um, so consciousness is a very good uh, economical parsimonious way to solve some track, you know, to make some computational problems tractable and qualitative states are sort of the placeholders that, that fill in the details or fill in the, the give the valence or give the, the qualities to that internal model that the agent's thinking about. Toward that end, then I want to talk about global workspace theory. So, what do I mean by that? Well, there's a this is a theory uh, that's come out of neuroscience in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, it starts with Bars and Edelman, very famous, very well established, important neuroscientists, um, and it's been carried on. It's become I'm no neuroscientist, but I think it's become widely accepted as one of the best. Um, cognitive neuroscience models we have for how human brains are conscious. Um, and it's built on empirical observations about how brains work. So it's got a bunch of basic features that are gonna be familiar to you and us. And we've been talking about this in the audience here. Um, so first off with human brains, we know this, that there's a lot of processing going on at any given time that's not sort of in the phenomenal conscious realm. It's below, it's subconscious, let's just, you know, there's a lot of the details here, but I'll just call it that for simple simplicity's sake. All the time, there's all sorts of things going on. So, you know, just an example I like to use is I'm, you know, currently sort of focusing my and, and attention to the next stage, stage. Attention is selective signal enhancement. And we use it to focus on one part of our sensory field rather than another. So right now I'm thinking about you and I'm looking at, you know, your image on my screen, but I've also got these neurons in my V1 cortex that process vertical lines and horizontal lines. That's pretty much all they're dedicated to. And they're, they're firing on the, the lines in the room that I'm in. 
line right now. So the vertical, there's a vertical line behind me, there's vertical lines on my screen, and they're all triggering off of those and firing because that's their job. When they see vertical lines, they, they fire. But until I uh, dedicate my attention to it, I don't think about that, it's not conscious. It was happening all along, it was happening even before I, I mentioned it. So attention to them is a spotlight that we direct to one thing versus another. And that lets us, you know, enables specific cognitive, the distribution of specific cognitive resources to some things that versus others, because there's always this economy problem that you know, I've only got so much time and energy and calories and, and brain work I can do. So I've got to, you know, focus on the important stuff, not everything else. Okay, so global workspace theory then is this view that consciousness is required for some specific cognitive tasks, including those that require, and this, these are big for, uh, for Dehane and the cache, durable information maintenance, novel combinations of operations, or spontaneous generation of intentional behavior. So that's their, their main three theses. And the idea is that when you've got consciousness present in an agent like you and me, or maybe like a, you know, a hominid or a chimpanzee, it's doing that work for them and getting them through the world because it provides that evolutionary ad ad advantage to adaptation to them. But that's not present in lots of other more simple um, organisms like, the, you know, like a plankton or, or like a, you know, a, a, a sea slug. It's got a, maybe has a nervous system, but it doesn't do this. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about those. One question, quickly. Matt, for you here, just from a, a yeah. clarification perspective, uh, is in that context of uh, global workspace, is almost every uh, perception or information processing that is going on in our uh, brains or minds have a intrinsic qualitative feel to it. And when many of us within the mind put this collective attention, this selective enhancement, then we become conscious of that thing, you know, but it was intrinsically, it, it, but it intrinsically always had, you know, uh, that qualitative feel or qualia to it. It is just that, you know, we are not conscious of it and we only become conscious of certain things. So is that a fair way to think about that almost everything has a, that is going on, has a qualitative feel to it. And if we put enough selective enhancement, yeah. attention on it and we become conscious, we become yeah. aware of it, uh, then it would feel like something. Uh, right. Is that a fair sort of- That's a great question. Um, I think the answer is no. Uh, I think that there's a fairly narrow range of, of specific kinds of contents in the brain that are accessible to attention and then accessible and broadcastable to the global workspace that can become conscious contents to me. And compared to the vast array of work that's going on at any given time, there's only a tiny frame of that, that, that stuff I can get to as me as sort of an aware agent. And lots of it just vanishes. Lots of it's never, it's not even in principle available to me. So the, um, the, 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 the processing work of the enteric nervous system in the stomach, there's a hundred million neurons that run your stomach. Mostly what we can feel about what's going on in our stomachs is just elongation and stretching. You feel full because you've eaten too much or you feel empty. Very simple, very primitive kinds of feels that come from that whole, you know, you, you vastly complicated system. hundred million neurons, you've got very low fidelity, very limited access to any of the work they're doing, even in the best of circumstances. And lots of other things going on, like your endocrine system and your, you know, your heart rate and your blood pressure and all that stuff, completely behind the scenes to you, never available to you, and they're not accessible in uh, as qualitative states. I think my question, Matt, there is hypothetically stating, let's say some, you know, uh, uh, 
blood flow that is going on in the heart or something that is going on maybe in the gut that today we are not conscious of. In a hypothetical experiment, if somehow somebody engineers extra sensations, extra sensory modality coming from that and get wired to the right part of the brain, would we become at that point conscious? I would say, well, man, there is like a river running in my gut. I never thought that there is a river running there, but now I can hear it and I can sense it and yeah. it smells bad or whatever. Do you right. think that, I think it is in that context that if more stuff, more sensory input gets to the right places, would we be able to, would it become conscious? Uh, uh, I, I suppose it's pretty speculative. I, I, um, I mean, much of this has all been sort of genetically organized by the way our brains are built and yeah. that we've got nothing we can do about that. I mean, there's some, maybe you can modify, maybe you can change things. Um, but also it, I, I just want to stress that I think that the actual range and contents of stuff that we get to in our conscious states is, is a tiny fraction of what's going on behind the scenes. And that was a preliminary point about just to get clear about the distinction between conscious and unconscious and um, how attention navigates those two realms. So we've got a vast realm of unconscious information processing that's going on. And then attention is the sort of uh, funnel through which uh, consciousness accesses some of that. Um, and so, the first point is about parallel distributed processing, which is familiar to anybody doing, you know, artificial neural networks and working in AI stuff. At any given time, many modular networks are active in parallel, processing a large amount of information unconsciously. And then here's the, the kicker from Dehane and Akash, is that the global workspace idea is this, is that you've got all that, that information that's being, that, that those sub networks are grinding on, like, those vertical edge detectors in my visual cortex that are firing, have been firing about the frame on my monitor all this time. That information discrimination that those little, that little network had been doing all this time I've been talking to you, it becomes conscious when it gets amplified and globally available to these other modules all over the brain. So there's a big transverse neural network uh, transverse neurons that then broadcast from you know that that little sub network that does the work on the vertical edge now he's become famous is the way dennett talks about this yeah. his work has become famous and it gets broadcast over because now i'm talking about the vertical edge on my my um, monitor i'm remembering it i'm pointing at it i'm giving it perceptual categorization and i'm forming that into the part of my intentional action because I'm talking about it and I'm, I'm, I'm bringing your attention to it. So that neural discrimination that had been going on all along in the background has now been broadcast all over the brain and all these other modules have gotten access to it. So I can talk about it, remember it, point to it, do all these other things. That's the global workspace and that's it. That's all consciousness is, is just taking a bit of work that one little you know, um, work team is doing down in the basement and then share it with the whole company so that everybody in the whole company is now working on it. In Physically the speaking, Matt, this uh, everybody becoming aware or this, you know, one perception getting it's a moment of fame and becoming conscious. What is it? Do you know about, is there an equivalent uh, neural correlate of that meaning, okay, well, that translates into more neuronal activity or, or some other physical mechanism that shows clearly, look, here is the global workspace stuff happening through these physical mechanisms. This perception is having its moment of fame. So yeah. can you maybe, if you know something about that, sir, can you please elaborate on that too? Yeah, well, that's a lot of the work that Dehane and Akash are doing in their labs, and they've actually mapped out some of these regions in the brain. And you'll get people like Christoph Cook, who, um, you know, there's a, a famous example of a Necker cube, which is that it's that 2D 
that's a box, that's a 3D box that's been drawn in two dimensions. And the neat thing about the, I should have, I didn't realize I was gonna talk about it, but the Necker cube is that you can sort of will yourself to see the leading edge or the trailing edge as the front. You can flip it by looking at it. Or like one of these optical illusions where it's a candlestick or it's yeah. like two sets of faces. So, you know, a lot of these labs will use an example like that and they'll have a test subject look at it and then they'll say, okay, at, you know, for the next three seconds, we want you to think about that as faces. And for the next three seconds, we want you to think about that as a candlestick <clears throat> or they want, we, we want you to flip it back and forth. And then they're able to, you know, with, with improving neural imaging technology, the fMRI machines and some of the, you know, the imaging technology we've got, they're able to now track which neurons are getting activated where and, and, and get a better picture about which neurons are responsible for doing the broadcasting and then what's lighting up when you think about it one way versus another way. Very interesting. Which also, you know, connects up to that, some of that research we've been talking about, about the, these people in the vegetative states and, and, you know, asking them to think about playing tennis versus walking in their house and all that. So as uh, neural imaging technology gets better, we're going to get finer and finer detail on which ones are working and how and what's getting lit up. Uh, but the, but for my purposes about the AI question, this is all, we can just keep this all sort of big and functional and just think about this in very, in very sweeping, broad functional terms. So what Dehane and Akech say is that they postulate that this is this global availability of that information from that little subnetwork being available all throughout the workspace to all these different modules, that that's what we subjectively experience as, con as a conscious state. So when it lights up and takes off that way, that content and gets broadcast across the brain, that's when it kind of comes to life to you or to me. And I realize, oh, the blueberry's blue or that blueberry's sweet. That's where it's become, you know, something that's crossed the threshold into this, into my world, into my yeah. phenomenal world, if that makes sense. Okay. So I find that really useful um, for thinking about you know, what use we might make of all of this in computer design to build a powerful, um, you know, cognitive agent that we want to solve some problems. Because evolution's come up with this as a way to sort of, a parse, it's a parsimony for, um, you know, stingily dispensing with calories. There's only so much I can look at or think about during the day. And I got to focus on the, you know, the way evolution built this is, it put a very high, you know, red flag rate on the things that are most survival salient. I, I actually was going to share this slide. I'll talk about it for a minute to see what you guys think about this. This is a very useful little study, and I'll explain it. It really helps me understand this difference between conscious and unconscious perceptions and how there's all this work going on behind the scenes. Um, and it helps me understand what happens when the global workspace gets activated and takes off. So what this slide represents is a, it's a graph that shows a study they did. And Dehane and Akach talk about this in the paper I've been referring to. And what they do is down at the bottom here are, these are milliseconds. So they show subjects a noisy picture of nothing, just a big blob for 500 milliseconds. And then they flash a picture of a face at them for 50 milliseconds, which is actually below sort of the threshold of something that you can report on. Yeah. So if we just did that and then showed you a noisy signal again, and we said, what did you see? You'd go, I didn't see anything at all. But then after another 33 seconds or 33 milliseconds of a noisy signal, we show them another picture. So there's identical ones where we show Tom Cruise, we flash a prime of Tom Cruise for 50 milliseconds, followed by a longer lingering picture of Tom Cruise for 500 milliseconds versus this is Cruise from a different angle versus Cruise's face this way, short than long. And this is another actor first and then Tom Cruise long. And what happens is that people can report on what they saw in the last column. If you show it to them for half a second, they're like, yeah, that's Tom Cruise. But that prime throws their systems off. 
if you show them the picture of Tom Cruise here first at the prime stage, they will identify Tom Cruise over here faster. But if you show them this picture or especially this picture, this is another actor. This is the guy from Trainspotting, I forget his name. If you prime them with that picture and then show them Tom Cruise, it actually takes them longer to identify Tom Cruise when you say, what did you just see? Very interesting. And I think what it's suggestive of is that there's the gears were turning, even with 50 milliseconds, even though you aren't aware of it, you are none the wiser. You never knew you saw this other actor's face. There are gears turning in your brain, categorizing and trying to process that first prime image and trying to get the, the gears turning to answer the question or try to feed into what am I seeing? What am I looking at? And if, you, if I feed you a prime that's something different, and then I show you the longer one, those gear, you know, that, that the metabolic processes to identify the first prime are already underway, and you've got to stop and halt that process neurologically and shift and get up out of that rut and go over and now identify Tom Cruise. So Very the, interesting. So the bottom one takes longer than the top one, which I find to be just amazing, right? Yeah, it is. So that's probably what I mean by unconscious perception, oh. that clearly the prime is having an effect on these subjects' cognitive systems. It's causing neurological events to unfold, but it's not accessible to them phenomenally as agents. If I'm just introspecting on what's the state of my mind right now, or what's the state of my stomach or anything, I can't tell you that it happened, but it definitely happened in my cognitive system, and it had an effect on my, the outputs of my cognitive system. So um, I find that to be really useful to help me sort of understand yeah. what's conscious, what's not conscious and what's going on behind the scenes versus what am I attending to? And then in the, in the letter to connect it back to global workspace theory, the point is when I show you a picture for long enough for you to get your brain around it and think about it, you can activate. And now I can say the words because I'm accessing the verbal centers, Tom Cruise, I'm accessing memory, I'm connecting it up to Mission Impossible movies and so on, and I'm doing all this much more robust processing because I've gotten my, you know, my brain around the thing I'm looking at. So back to Dehane and Catch, what they think that consciousness is for, and let me expand on these points a little bit. So they said durable and explicit information maintenance. So here's the problem, when I, when my eyes cicade across the room or I look out the window and look back or when a car drives by on the street, that sensory encounter happens for what, a second, and then it's gone. Okay, well, as a cognitive agent trying to navigate a complicated world where there's lots of things trying to kill me, it would be useful if I could build a construct, a representational construct of that car and deal with it in, in my head, even when the car is not present, or even when the object is not present in my environment. If I can plan, if I can analyze, if I can remember, if I can think it about it, if I can model it, if I can develop causal theories about it, I'm so much, I'm way ahead, right? So, yeah. you know, imagine like an animal with severe amnesia, and it just sees whatever's in front of it at that moment. Maybe it's like our dogs, you know, your dog is very happy to see you uh, when you come, but it's just a surprise. There you are, you're home, and then you leave and the dog just goes back to sleeping and sort of, you know, this, it, there's not sort of a lot of object continuity there for the, for the dog. So yeah. object, object continuity inside the representational forum in there is, is highly adaptive for obvious reasons, right? Yeah. If, if the tiger ducks behind the rock, and I know there's still a tiger there, I'm much better off than if I just think, oh, no tiger, I'm, I'm fine, <laughs> right? So, so we need uh, the, cognitive, the cognitive system that can uh, build and hold on to a, an object in the, and I hesitate to use the theater model, but inside um, is, is gonna get ahead, it's gonna help it. If it's not conscious, we don't remember it, maintaining representations actively internally even in the absence of stimulation helps. It's, it's that's what consciousness does for me. It lets me solve novel combinations of operations. When I encounter a new, a new problem, a new challenge in the world, 
I can look at it and deal with it and go, well, this is kind of like that situation, but it's also kind of like that situation that I encountered. And maybe this other solution I used will work here. So lots of, uh, uh, of our cognitive processing can be relegated to, um, you know, those zombie, what, you know, people call zombie units. Yeah. Um, so if you've got a pitching coach or a batting coach, the batting coach will take the baseball player and make them slow down and think and deliberately analyze the way they're moving their elbow and their arm. I've been thinking about, you know, weightlifting. I've been working on weight, weight training stuff. And instead of just going in and, you know, doing the same old thing, weightlifting, I've been watching these videos where a trainer is talking specifically about which muscles getting used and how's it getting used at what angle. And so it's a, a it, it attend, my attention is able to focus and then redirect my behavior to do to solve sort of new problems and, and new challenges. So we need consciousness to do that. Consciousness helps devise novel strategies, evaluate them and control their execution, correct errors for new situations, new problems. And then it helps for intentional behavior. And I apologize for the long passage here, but um, this is in, pass, in connection with what I've said already, contents of consciousness need to be reportable with language, available for planning, accessible to a wide range of capacities and memorable and so on. And without consciousness, you can't do a lot of that. You can't, um, your model of the world can't penetrate deeply out into causal, you know, structures or causal behaviors um, and qualitative properties on my sensations are sort of the fill. They're the, the shorthand or the, um, the, the pricey report that gives me a quick and dirty picture of what it is I'm thinking about rather than the exhaustive, you know, depthy analysis. A qualitative sensation is just a, um, a cartoon, if you will, that gives me a very quick computationally tractable um, object that I can manipulate in consciousness to move it around and you know, move the players on the board and, and plan and devise things. And qu qualitative features are like, that provide that. And I can say some more about that as we, as we push forward. The hand and the catch, and I've, I've made this point, they say, look, the, what global workspace model does is, or what the global workspace does is, it connects up perception, motor control, long-term memory, quality and reliability evaluations, attentional direction, and so on. So this is some stuff I lifted out of their passage. Um, that's all of the work that, that these transverse global workspace neurons enable across these different regions of the brain. And once it gets there, it's now famous and now lit up and now we can, you know, now it's something to you to think about. Okay, so getting to the heart of the question then, why qualitative states in consciousness. Why does it have to feel like something versus nothing? And famously, Chalmers's original you know, thought experiment here was to imagine in his 1995 book, was to imagine that we could, he says, we could imagine that all of the laws of physics are exactly the same and all of the chemistry and all the neural events are exactly the same. Um, and that everything unfolds with me talking and talking to you and talking about myself and reporting my thoughts and all that, all of that goes exactly the same. But in fact, there's nothing, there's no lights on at home. There's nobody at home. It's dark inside. And this is Chalmers' famous uh, philosophical zombie problem. He said, it's logically possible that uh, you could have all the physics be the same and there'd be no internal fields. It'd be completely dark and um, empty of qualities inside. And that's a, that's a detailed and technical argument. I don't wanna go into it, um, but, but his so-called hard problem is the question, well, why then are physical systems doing what they do with physical causes accompanied by qualitative fields because they don't seem to be necessary. They seem to be extraneous. They're not, they're not dictated or they're not forced by physical law. 
Now, I said a bunch of things there that I disagree with strongly, but that's sort of the way he presents the position. And I won't, um, I won't dive into it. I've got a whole lecture on it in my philosophy of mind class that if people want to chase it down. But that's kind of the idea. The philosophical zombie is we imagine that somebody is doing all the things I'm doing, but there's no, um, there's nothing, there's nothing inside that it feels like to be me. And Chalmers thought that was a coherent possibility. And I think it's an incoherent possibility. Dehane and Nakach reject it. Um, and, it's, and, and the reasons are uh, related to what I've been saying so far, that there's a whole bunch of these very interesting, very powerful uh, representational modeling problems that you can't do unless you've got this internal arena with these fields in there. And you, in evolution, discovered that um, we can provide this organism with qualitative fields and that gives them gives their cognitive systems power to predict and analyze and solve problems and navigate the world much better it provides an adaptive advantage than uh, creatures that don't have it you can't just you can't get this kind of um, behavior and this kind of sophisticated problem solving from a system that's a mere zombie. Uh, and that's, that's my answer and that's Dehane and Cash's answer uh, that comes out of this research that they're doing. Okay, so um, here's a bit more from them the, to sort of elaborate on that point. They say, why, is, why are qualitative states ineffable? And the idea is that, you know, I could tell you, I could talk to you all day about what the red of the stop sign is like, but at the end of the day, there's something about it that only you can feel inside your mind and only I can feel inside mine. And there's something about that, that that's not translatable or not um, uh, discursive that we can't, I can't drape it with language. The language doesn't capture, it leaves something out, uh, always leaves something out. Okay, well, Dehane and Nakash are, are prepared to accept that. They're fine with that. Um, and their idea is that the flux of so much perceptual experience, and you said, you know, uh, you said something about this earlier about, you know, the, the subtle qualitative feels of a certain kind of state you're in. It's just too diverse at any given time for accurate verbal description or, or for memory storage. I mean, I could, I could try, but at best, you know, if I try to report the contents of my emotional or um, sensory states from yesterday afternoon when I was at the gym, I could talk and talk and talk, but I'm going to exhaust my memory there. And there's going to be a lot about what I was going through with my, you know, PDP system that was soaking up all of this sensation from my environment that I'm just not going to be able to report on and I'm not gonna be able to communicate. I can't capture it all. It just takes too much memory storage to capture all that. So as a result, uh, the contents can't be memorized and they can't be transmitted. So something's always left out, hence it's ineffable. That's why we just can't, that's why it always seems like there's something about our qualitative states that cannot be captured and shared with somebody else. Yeah. But that's a predictable outcome of the way these systems are built. Uh, okay. So, um, and what happens is when I start trying to talk about it, I'm forced to render those particular um, ineffable, unique sensory states down into, I have to distill and simplify and reduce and give a short answer to them. And I end up calling it red or shades of red, you know, okay. or imagine you go to the Home Depot and they've got you know, to my frustration, they've got a hundred different whites in the white section yeah. and they've got all these different names. You know, there's yeah. a Mexican, Mexican heather grass and there's eggshell and there's all these different yeah. ivories yeah. and all that. And I can kind of see the difference between them. I can make distinctions, but I couldn't remember the differences. I couldn't report on those. It's just something I feel when I'm there, but yeah. my words can't capture it all. Right. Yeah. Because it's something I'm feeling at the moment. Okay, so to the hard problem then, 
Chalmers has argued that everything that could be performed by zombie units, that everything could be performed by zombie units with no internal fields. And Dehane and Nakash are arguing, look, without global availability, where you broadcast these contents all over the brain, lots of processing, processing like planning, anticipating problems, and problem solving just can't happen. You, you, you need that durable, sustained representation in mind so I can form plans and ideas about it and think to myself, I'm gonna go pick blueberries, they're almost ripe. Um, and tomorrow they'll be ripe, so it's time to get them because that's when they taste the best. And zombie units, uh, mere zombie units at these low level processing, like those ones that do the you know, vertical line processing in my visual cortex, they can't do that work. That work is high level abstract work that's done on these objects with they're, they have fill, they have you know, qualitative properties to them that are sort of shorthand references to what the object is in the world that I encountered. That makes sense so far? It does, kind of, yeah. Um, okay, so, and their view is that global availability can't happen unless there's represent, where those representations feel like something to the agent and the feels are a short version um, of it rendered to me. So, you know, the, uh, I keep using blueberries. I've got blueberries in my example here coming up. Um, look, uh, I, have, I have a friend who has a, a vineyard and this is quite amazing actually. They, they, grew all these wine, they grew all these wine grapes and the grapes were ripening and ripening and ripening and they knew right when they were gonna be ripe and they were planning to harvest them. And he said that the, the squirrels and the deer and the birds descended on his little vineyard the night before they were going to harvest all those grapes because they knew that, that that's when they were at peak sweetness yeah. and they were at that the best nutritional value, right? So the, the raccoons know as well as I do what tastes like a good grape, right? Yeah. So, well, what is that? Well, that sweetness is the way it feels to me. It feels good on my yeah. tongue. But what it is, is a, it's a glucose molecule. And evolution is trying to build a, an organism that, that, that is oriented in its environment around glucose molecules, among other things. Yeah, It yeah. likes those and it, it avoids other things. Well, you need to give it a meter or some tools to be able to identify and, and track glucose yeah. molecules. Okay, well, I can't do a chemical assay on it. I can't put it in a test tube and break it down and, and, and take it to, or put it in a mass spectrometer. Evolution's trying to give me some like rough and ready, quick tools that will help me find glucose. Yeah. What is that? The, that's ripe fruit. You know, that's, that's, this, that's an indicator. It's a very fast, quick and dirty, computationally tractable measure of when the bananas are ripe, when the, when the grapes are ripe, when the blueberries are ripe, those colors are, the, are the, um, the tell, the report that tells me, okay, now, now that thing's good and ready to eat. And, and their idea, and I think they're dead right about this, is that, look, you, you need to be able to model anything, a human and an AI system, if it's gonna solve, you know, sort of complicated problems in its environment. It's not just simply like, you know, a very simple primitive nervous system in some little organism in the ocean might just be oriented towards moving towards temperature gradients. So it just moves towards the warm water and away from the cold water. It might be that's its only two values in its world, right? Um, but if you want a, a, a cognitive system that's more powerful than that, you need it to have these sort of um, um, a, a more robust in-depth mental model of the world but to do that you still got computational problems so colors and making feet rendering feels to the system as a kind of shorthand is a way to solve the problem um and very computationally efficient as well right and and to the extent that um you know i think that we can learn from evolution here to the extent that evolution discovered here's a quick and easy way to efficiently steer this organism through the world or give it information about the world we might well want to build ai systems to be able to form high level abstract um kind of property judgments about the way things feel 
Now, maybe very different kinds of sensory apparatus. You know, can imagine a system that has its feelers out into the whole global power grid or into the whole logistical supply chain where it feels the supply chain, like it, the way I feel proprioception or something, yep. right? Imagine an AI system that you could provide to a customer that does that, where, you know, um, I mean, I'm just speculating about what your company does, you, but imagine Toyota has got this problem where they, they're trying to part uh, and source tens of thousands of different parts from different suppliers to bring them in to build a car. And they need to have all the parts there in the right time, in the right order, in the right quantities available at the right time. So it's a, va you know, it's a staggering logistical problem. Well, one way to solve that might be imagine, you, know, you were talking about rewiring a human so that they could feel their stomach in a new way. Well, imagine rewiring a human so that they could feel the supply chain, yeah. the way that we feel proprioception, the way I feel like where my toes are right now, but now it's me knowing where those, where those, uh, you know, the screws are from that plant in China that we need for building the car. Yeah. So I can imagine this solving a similar kind of computational problem for AI designers that that evolution found for, you know, finding ripe fruit for us. And my goal here is to try to make it sound a little less insane that an AI system might be conscious and might have qualitative states. So I'm just trying to like close the gap here to make that seem less counterintuitive to folks, because that's what our, that's what I'm kind of suspect is going on. Uh, okay, so um, their view answered this question, could all of those functions be performed without qualitative content to the subject? And the answer is no. There has to be some subjective state to share with the various subsystems. The blueness of the blueberry, the, the blueberry is an object that's blue and sweet, has to get passed around um, to my verbal center, to my you know motor center, to my memory, to all of that. Um, okay, so they've got this, Here's a couple of quotes from them about the evolution of consciousness. This is from them, not from me. The more an organism can rely on mental simulation, building this representational world and internal evaluation to select a course of action instead of acting out in the open world, the lower are the risks and expenditure of energy. Yeah. And it doesn't fit exactly here in my slides, but this is really um, insightful because, you know, you. If, if you can spend some time imagining the consequences of your actions inside your head before you actually go do them, that's a lot cheaper, a lot less dangerous than actually going and doing it to see what happens. So if I can run the little causal scenario about, well, what happens if I you know, jump off this cliff or what happens if I do this or do that, could I succeed? Or if I go hunting, um, what happens if I, um, you know, try to corral the antelope into this canyon. Um, oh, that might be a useful way for us to trap the antelope and then we can catch them, right? So you can imagine early Paleolithic hunters uh, it, that, that having this capacity to imagine and work out the details in their representational systems confers this adaptive advantage. And, and for similar reasons, we can imagine the AI systems are gonna benefit from being able to run hypothetical scenarios in mind without actually, you know, uh, sending trucks to the plant or whatever you might have them doing. So by allowing more sources of knowledge to bear on this internal decision process, the neural workspace may represent an additional step in a general trend towards an increasing internalization of representations in the course of evolution, whose main advantage is the freeing of the organism from its immediate environment. So, you know, the difference between you and one of these primitive sea organisms that's just reactive to temperature gradients in the, in the water is that I can sit back and plan and I can think about, well, if I want to go swim in the ocean, I'd rather go to San Diego because the temperature, the water, temperature of water is warm there. How do I get to San Diego? I can devise a plan. I can do all that from my armchair versus an organism, organism that's wired in real time to just react to whatever's happening to it. So the more, that's what, partly what I mean by the more robust and more detailed the, the cognitive model gets, the more powerful it is to be able to sort of survive and, and, and navigate the world around.
Um, okay, so I can now actually sum up, and I'm sorry for lecturing so long, but I can actually sum it. up, I can sum up uh, uh, like point by point stuff I've been saying in about eight points here over the course of all of our podcasts so far. And I think most of it will make sense. And it'll also lead to the question about AI systems. So if you're gonna, if evolution is gonna build a cognitive agent or a computer scientist is gonna build a cognitive agent, they, they want to solve problems, it needs information from some channels. We've got ours and they're, they're gonna have theirs. It needs attention, selective signal enhancement to better distribute limited cognitive resources. And it needs to represent that information when it's not currently sensed to better plan, decide, remember, and analyze. So it's got to have these durable representations that persist beyond immediate sensations. Okay, that's the start. It also needs uh, being able to recognize the uh, or report the contents of its own cognitive system to itself. So I need to be able to notice what I'm thinking and being able to do that significantly expands its capacity to plan and analyze and so on. If I know what I'm thinking about, I can direct myself to think, no, I need to spend more time thinking about food and less time thinking about recreation, right? more time thinking about securing resources, less time thinking about that or that. I can direct my, the contents of my own cognitive work. That confers a huge uh, evolutionary ad advantage and it might be highly adaptive and useful for an AI system too, to be able to distribute its own uh, work and know what matters and know what doesn't. And I know you've talked about before about how you have the human element that's still engaged in some of your supply chain logistics where they direct, you need the human to come in and make a decision about what's important, what's not. Yep. Uh, and, and the human is serving as the kind of meta level yeah. Uh, judge about meta, doing the metacognitive meta work. Being able to represent itself adds a substantial layer to its problem solving capacities. And then, and I've made this point a couple of podcasts before, being able to organize my world into agents and non-agents to know who's got a mind and who doesn't. That's a really powerful capacity. Um, if I, you know, um, can it's just a very fundamental distinction that we make about objects in our world and i've mentioned graziano here but graziano's um, um attention schema theory of awareness is very good on this and his recent book is great on this uh agents uh, being able to to parse the world into minds and non-minds hugely adaptive and powerful and advantage advantageous and you know it's what it's what our Siri systems or our Amazon home systems lack now. Uh, and I always talk about this. It's what would be really fantastic is if, is if my Amazon home, I mean, not Amazon, but my Google home system knew, modeled me as an agent, as a thinker, as a mind, and it could start formulating ideas about what I like, what I don't like, and why I like it and all that. Um, you know, we've got some primitive algorithms for this sort of thing, like Netflix, you know, devises a, has an algorithm for what movies I like, what movies I don't like, but it's not based on thinking about me as a, as a person with preferences. It's just based on compiling other people's preferences and connecting yeah. them all up. But if I can divide them into minds, that's much better, much more powerful. That's, this is what's been called the intentional stance or having theory of mind. So being able to recognize other agents that represent like I do empowers me to understand the, the world much better because I can figure out what they're going to do and where they're moving next and I can anticipate their actions and so on. And then getting to the quality point, those internal reports to the system by my system need to be condensed, reduced, and simplified. And that's my point about glucose versus you know, ripe berry color. Ripe berry color gives me a quick shorthand answer to the chemical, you know, survival problem I'm trying to solve. Um, and it looks like from Dehane and the Cash, you need to have qualitative states in there as a kind of um, cartoon version to 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 let you uh, manipulate your, you know, the chessboard in your head. Yeah. 
because it's it's simpler and easier to pass. So those internal reports of the system to the system have to be rendered um, into a representational form that's accessible to and by the agent. And I don't know what glucose is. I wouldn't recognize it if I saw it. Um, I wouldn't recognize the molecule if I saw it. I, I can't look at the molecules that are too small, but if you put it on my tongue, I know it when I taste it. So that's rendering a chemical you know, compound in the world into terms I can deal with, with my meat body. Yep. So the information construct has to take a new stable representational form and now it's sweet to me with properties that provide opportunities for my planning and analysis and all that. Okay, so finally to the blueberries. Hence, this whole model of representational subjectivity is highly advantage, advantageous for cognitive agents. And it's gotta have qualitative features that the agent can work with because yeah. those are the feels that it, its system renders and that it can think about and feel and, and work with. That's the way the world gets rendered to it when it has these encounters with the object. So the sweetness of the blueberries is a marker and it's a translation of this environmental information into a form that the subject with their particular faculties can feel, recall, behave, make decisions with regard to and plan and all that. Um, okay, so the qualitative interface makes fast computational, computationally tractable work out of all that and the global workspace system lets it broadcast all that work and the smells and the tastes and the flavors do that work. Um, it's the object taken from the outside and rendered on the, in the terms of the inside. Um, and now I can recognize myself as having those sensations as a result of my encounter with the object on my sensory periphery. The flavor is what that object is to me or me with my system, the way it's rendered. Okay, so, uh, and I, I was gonna throw this other question aside. First, I'm gonna ask, I've been talking a lot. You, have you got ideas or questions or things you wanna contribute or raise here on the side? I think one thing maybe to uh, talk about uh, would be uh, your thoughts on how to, in a computer science sense, how to, represent different qualitative states. So, you know, and I'm just now making it up, having different kind of number schemes uh, to say, well, uh, this kind of representation we are gonna use for color and this kind of representation we are gonna use for this so that we are not uh, mixing things up and we have, we are maintaining this distinctive feel because you know the qualitative state of color whatever it is is very different from the qualitative feel of sound and and so on and so forth uh and uh, uh so would love to understand that in a computer science sense what are your sort of thoughts on how to devise a representational scheme for these qualitative internal states, which then a software agent yeah. uh, can start noticing and say, well, you know, I'm noticing my own internal states and, uh, and they, are, they are distinct from each other, even though uh, they are helping me model a certain object or a situation that I'm in. So would love to hear your perspective on yeah. uh, the, some engineering engineering yeah. aspects of it. That's a great question. Um, so I've, I've got another slide elsewhere, but, but um, I won't distract with that. I have another slide that shows the response curve for the various rods and cones in the human eyeball. And we've got these three different receptors. Um, green, I can't remember what they are now, yellow, red, and blue or something. We've got these three different basic receptors and humans more or less, when you, when you shoot EM radiation at them between the roughly the 400 to 800 nanometer range, those rods and cones in the eyeball 
will register that as color. Yeah. Um, you know, from from deep violet all the way up to sort of bright, you know, to red, or I can't remember the details on it. And then further out on the EM spectrum, if you go out to ultraviolet or you go to X-rays or radio waves or whatever, those are those are not picked up by our detectors. So, I mean, I guess one question you're going to ask in the actual when you get down to brass tacks about building an artificial system is, well, what do we want it to pay attention to in the world? What do we want it to to track? Is we might want it to track X-rays or ultraviolet or you know, microwave radiation. And, and you know, we, in, in which case, we may not want it to even bother with EM radiation at all, but if we do, then, you know, we may, you know, we may tack its uh, sensory apparatus to a different part of the, the spectrum. Uh, we may carve it up differently. So there's actually, there's a, there's a genetic variant in some humans where there's some people, I think it's mostly women, who can see a different shade of red because they've got a different receptor. So there's all kinds of neat questions here about perception and sensation. And there's obviously lots of men, there's one in nine men who are colorblind and they can't make fine distinctions between blue and gray. Uh, so those are, you know, those are people being able to make different or not be able to make different fine discriminations between different sensory uh, ranges. And we can imagine, you know, um, giving AI systems all sorts of different sensory apparatus for different kinds of information about their environment. It might be electrical, it might be EM radiation. Um, you receive perturbations of airwaves as sound on your eardrums, as you pointed out, right? And I hear, you know, your voice gets reproduced on the speakers on my, on my computer and it recreates, you know, the, the texture and the, 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 uh, the hertz and the wavelengths of your speaking on your side um, that, and then jiggles my eardrum. And we can imagine a system that's built very differently that maybe um, detects uh, air vibrations of different, frequencies or uh, above or below the human range, or maybe not, again, not at all. And then you can imagine carving it up with different um, gradations. Yeah. Maybe we want it to, you know, humans can roughly detect 20 to 20,000 Hertz um, in sound waves. Maybe we want it to detect way more, way less, or maybe we want it to make very fine gradations within that humans can't really pick up, you know, differences between, you know, 440 hertz and 441 that you can't hear, but maybe we want uh, an AI system that helps produce music to be able to tell the difference. Yeah. Does that does that get to your question? Or yeah. What you're thinking about? Yeah. But it also opens the door to wild possibilities about our tacking on radically different kinds of sensory apparatus. Maybe we want it to detect the presence of sodium ions in solution. Or you know maybe we you know we, we just the sky's the limit here about what this what the sensory intake side might look like, which you know suggests radically wildly different kinds of consciousnesses that would result on the other end. I mean if you and me are struggling to try to share our experience about a a dinner we had where I'm spending all this time trying to talk to you and you've got equipment like me. And I'm trying to describe this fantastic hamburger I had or whatever, uh, you know, um, or sushi or something. You, at least I can assume, have very similar apparatus, a very similar nervous system to me. And we've got a lot to talk about. We can sort of analogize and kind of triangulate on the experience and share verbally what we're talking going through. But you can imagine there being a real disconnect between us and AI systems that are built, you know, radically different kinds of structures here. Yeah, so opens, true. Opens the door to some really wild, lots of good science fiction novel possibilities. Here. Yeah. Um, okay, so getting back to then to my ultimate answer, I'm proud of myself for getting here. I know I've been very long-winded. We may, we may well find we want to build AI systems that can solve certain kinds of problems that, are, that resemble the problems that humans, that evolution designed us to solve. 
And those problems may be of the sort that we want to mimic some of the parsimony, the information economy, and the cognitive organization of human cognitive systems. So I say we take all of this lessons we're learning from the evolution of, of human consciousness and understanding how evolution, how consciousness functions in the human brain. And then if we want to lift some big functional features out of that, because they work well to solve problems, then we give those to our future AI systems. So to the extent that consciousness and qualitative states then serve us in solving those sorts of problems, we may, may want to build AI systems that are similarly conscious and yeah. have qualitative internal representations like ours. So that's the sort of the big closing, the big circle that I wanted to do that sort of started on this conversation you and I were having, you know, months ago in the first podcast, where I wanted to be much more clear about what I, why I thought an AI system might be conscious and why I thought it's at least plausible that it could have or should have qualitative states in certain kinds of, in certain kinds of circumstances. Uh, it really brings it into perspective that why we artificial consciousness can help with certain type of problem solving approaches. And if uh, machines have artificial consciousness that overlaps with some of our consciousness, then we have some common reference frame to talk about and uh, share experiences and uh, all that fun stuff. Because if to your point, uh, machines experiences are very different from ours and too alien and uh, then uh, they would not, you know, know what we are qualitatively feeling, right. and there is less to uh, talk about in that sense. And the conversation would be then uh, not as rich, uh, and 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 that kind of a thing. I also agree with you that Chalmers' uh, zombie argument does not make sense in the following. Uh, sort of way, if if in my head I assume for a minute that when I look at stuff, uh, I don't see colors, but uh, my mind, my zombie mind, computes the word. Okay, uh, you are looking at a shape, uh, and it is a black shape. Just the word black. Oh, and now you're looking at a shape, and it is a red shape. And these are just words a word black and a word red, I would lose so much functionality and utility because now I have to remember uh, the difference between the word black and the word red. And without that qualitative morphing, that qualitative feeling, which is a very efficient way to say, okay, you know, redness is different from blackness, from purpleness and that kind of a thing. Uh, if I, it's a very efficient representation. If, if some other representation, if it is just words, uh, I would be, it would be metabolically very expensive and uh, it would be too difficult to remember and whatnot. So at some level, uh, to me, when I just as a lay person, look at consciousness, the, the contents of consciousness, all these qualitative states, uh, they are very efficient representations of the world and really help in a very energy efficient way to you know, do attribution and modeling uh, and to be able to talk about it. And then uh, the, the fact that then we become aware or uh, conscious of those uh, states through uh, models like global workspace, uh, uh, certainly there is strong engineering relevance there that uh, if everybody, is speaking the same language, even when language has many different dimensions to it. It has a color dimension, it has a sound dimension, it has you know all these different sensory dimensions and fields to it. But if every part of the system uh, 
knows how to speak that language, right. uh, then uh, you can have an architecture in which a mind can happen and uh, we all part of the part of the mind, part of those neurons can agree upon, okay, let's for a few minutes pay attention to uh, all different aspects of uh, a blueberry and uh, all different parts of the brain uh, would say, well, yeah, so let's, let's, let's talk about that. And, and then we move on to the next and the next, whatever the attention algorithm is. Uh, point of that is, all these things slowly take mystery away. Uh, and I like your notion very much that if all those conditions of mind are met, then we can assume that the machine is experiencing something. Mm -hmm. So that I find a very strong sort of, you know, I, I find that very powerful that if right. all those conditions are met, then uh, machines are machines are conscious as well in the sense of that there is somebody home, they are experiencing something as well. Uh, I uh, Have you heard, Matt, about Donald Hoffman? I don't think so. I'll send you some of his uh, uh, links and stuff. So he talks about uh, similar things uh, as well uh, that how, evolution gave birth to uh, consciousness and then the type of consciousness that we have is, and the type of qualitative states that we have, they are useful to our survival and that kind of thing. He is mm -hmm. a, uh, I think a cognitive scientist at UC Irvine, uh, okay. Donald Hoffman. Oh, uh, I think I have, I have heard of him. I, Sam Harris interviewed him a couple of years ago. And he's yeah. got a book out about this, uh, this sort of a uh, hallucination view about you, you don't perceive reality, you just perceive your hallucination. Um, yeah. yeah, I do know that guy's work. And yeah. there's a similar, similar point. Yeah. And, I, and I just add that what you just said made me feel optimistic, like I'd sort of gotten through part of what I was trying to get through. And I just, you know, strong, even stronger than, than the Chalmers point that here's a simple way to put it there's a certain level of smart that just can't be achieved unless you've got this agent building these internal models. That's right. And building those internal models imposes certain kinds of um, computational restraints on us because of you know limits on computational power. Yep. So that makes qualitative properties necessary for building a, a system that's above that threshold of smartness. We can build dumb systems that do other, they do simpler things, but if you wanted to do some of these more sophisticated things, it needs to be able to build the world in its mind and qualitative properties are world building materials for a cognitive agent inside. So now, very powerful. To that end, I, I'm going to throw a wrench in my own gears here with it, with something that I haven't said a word about so far. And I wonder what you think about this. Once we get to this stage, now there's a host of important moral considerations and problems that come yeah. to bear on this sort of project. Because, you know, what I've just suggested or what I've just described is building a new thing in the world that feels. And potentially, to your point early on in this conversation, something that feels good things or feels bad things, it feels pains or pleasures. So now we've got a whole serious, yeah. you know, uh, set of moral considerations to throw into the, you know, and there's people out there arguing like Susan Schneider, I'm not sure she's wrong about this, and Eric Schweitzgebel is worried about it too. This, this alone may be enough reason to keep us from ever wanting to do something like this. Because, you know, what if you're creating this entity then and then turning it on just produces now a conscious being that's in excruciating torment yeah. as a result of the way you've 
you know, designed it or, the, or its ability to self-reflect or whatever. Um, and that might be, and now we've got a whole new ballgame, right? Because, you know, imagine the way people sort of expanding the circle of moral consideration to, you know, they, you know, there's people arguing we should extend it to animals, we shouldn't eat animals, or we shouldn't torture animals. We've got, you know, we've got restrictions on what you can do to, to cows and chickens and, and, uh, and pigs and the like. Um, so it may just that, that I've, I've bracketed off that discussion entirely here, but it's obviously important and relevant to the, to the project. But no, 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 you, you know, I think we should dedicate some of our future sessions to these yeah. moral and ethical oh, a great integrations. Idea. I mean, you are so right. We as people, we are not equipped to deal with things like that. Our history is very poor. I mean, right. if we just think about uh, global workspace theory and we look at the theory of evolution and uh, all the genetics and common heritage we share with all other animals, it is very clear to me that those any animal, any creature, living creature that I come in contact with you know, they are feeling, they are feeling something, right? So uh, I think the uh, feeling of pain is a common thing. Long time ago, a biologist friend of mine at MIT shared with me, he said, Amjad, if a living being has got, and a living being uh, uh, that is a product of evolution, has got a sensory apparatus. It is only there because he or she or it can do something with it. That sensory apparatus is not there for fun or for no purpose. You can almost assume that if there are eyes, then that living creature has some ability to see. Similarly, if in their skin, there are nociceptors, there are pain receptors, then they have some capacity to experience pain. Might be a bit different from our capacity to experience pain, and they may not have colorful language or language that we understand to describe, but just saying that they don't have the soul, they don't have the spirit, certain faculties are only for human. Well, certainly now we all know that is a pretty dated view, but yet today, to your point, January 13th, we have no problem uh, killing animals, torturing animals, and not granting them any rights whatsoever. We, we farm them. We think about them as plants so that we can harvest them and whatnot. Right. Your point that, uh, and look, and I am no different. You know, I, in fact, I'm one of the hypocrites because, you know, I, I enjoy my steaks and I enjoy my chickens and I say, well, I didn't kill that animal, but I take joy in eating that. So, so I am no exception. I'm part of that, right. part of that crowd out there as people, as, you know, you are so right that we don't extend that courtesy uh, of ethics and morality to fellow mammals. Uh, so machines, you know, tough luck and whatnot. Well, even minimally, uh, even, even the most enthusiastic carnivore is gonna acknowledge that we grant animals, especially some of these higher mammals, we grant them some moral consideration you know, that, that, that no matter how enthusiastic somebody is about eating their steaks, they're going to acknowledge that, you know, the suffering of a, you know, a, you, the family dog gets hit by a car and gets a broken leg and is laying there whimpering. Everybody knows that that's pain yeah. and that's suffering. And we all know that that because we you love the animal, you, it deserves some moral and personal consideration, right? So, you don't, you know, even though people are hypocritical about this, uh, I guess my point was, uh, so here's a real moral dimension we're adding to the discussion because we may be that we yeah. are about to throw the switch and turn something on that is going to have experience 
and that could be just as relevant to you know our moral status as being a parent um you know as a parent you're you ha have some moral set of moral obligations of to take care of the child and and make sure it has a certain kind of experience you don't want it to have you know so depending on what sort of moral convictions you've got you're gonna have different answers to these stories and these questions but they're legitimate worries and it, they may be so significant that they cut us off from this kind of inquiry or this kind of pursuit a friend once said that hey you know what if you hypothetically design a machine where it is stuck in a suffering loop right. it can only just suffer right. it and you have not given it any way to modify its behavior right. and and move away from suffering to yeah. to joy and whatnot that you are just right. a stupid engineer stupid designer uh, i'm just making jokes at my expense uh, this was my 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 friend saying those things to me lovingly and say you just you know just because you could you are you know in your sort of entrepreneurial hacker right. style of right. you know let's try it out that you create something and it is now just feeling awful right because uh the way the physics and entropy is uh most likely the first experience that you would be able to create would be of suffering then you would have to figure out what I, what do i do what do i do to you know make right. it suffering go away and what not so i think you are shining light matt on a that there are there is a whole other dimension to this because you know most experiences even for us as people look at all the we even talked about in the last episode how much suffering is out there and right. how much suffering we as people inflict on each other so let alone now we create a whole new set of organisms uh, and machines you know who are also kind of in that category we will save that i think yeah. we'll just dedicate one of our future right. sessions matt just on those because those are very important uh very important considerations uh but this has been a fascinating chat matt uh as uh, always and i'm so looking forward to just uh continuing our conversations and uh thank you sir thank you so much i really appreciate the opportunity to like dig in and talk about this in more depth